Bubby, take a picture of this and we can tweet it and do other things with it later. <laughs> awesome. Well, that's what that's what's all about. And, and saying at the end of this, I will be sent an audio and and the video. So if you if you want a copy of that, um, I can probably drop box it to you for your own personal use as well. Okay, yeah, I'm happy yeah. to share. All right. <laughs> okay. Hello and welcome everybody. This is episode 23 of the eCourse Domination podcast. And today I've got Vicky Maris with me. Now, Vicky is an author, speaker, and online instructor. She actually works for one of the big 10 universities and teaches courses and workshops on a number of subjects, including leadership, business communication, social media, and course design. So without any further ado, I'd like to hand over to Vicky so she can introduce herself and give us a bit of background on what she's been doing and what she's going to be doing. Yes. Thank you for having me on your podcast and on the blab, Tim. It's great to be here. As uh, you mentioned, I have a day job at Purdue University, which is in West Lafayette, Indiana, and that's in the Midwestern part of the United States. And I've been there for about 17 years in various roles, mostly in marketing and communications roles within continuing education. Um, so just recently, I moved over to the academic side of the house on the uh, four credit courses and degree programs. And prior to that, all of my effort had been in areas that serve lifelong learners who already have their degrees and are out in their careers and then looking for certification courses and uh, things where they, they don't need academic credit, but they're looking for something to advance their learning. So uh, I've, I'm in a shift right now. I've been there about a year, but it still feels really different. I'm over at the department I'm in now is uh, biomedical engineering in the Weldon School, which mm. Uh, is a wonderful place to be. I'm having a lot of fun over there. It's a great group of people. And the things they create over there that help all of us, the, the, the medical devices that they're inventing to put in those of us who have medical needs, I just, every day, I'm amazed at what I learn. So anyway, I do not claim to be an engineer in any way, shape, or form. Uh, when I was in one of my previous roles at the university, uh, one of my uh, supervisors, who's now the Dean of Agriculture at Purdue, Jay Ackridge, uh, visited with me and said, Vicki, you're, you'd be crazy not to go ahead and get another degree while you're working for the university and you know take advantage of the staff fee remits and that sort of thing. And honestly, I hadn't really thought about it too much. I had been out in corporate America for 11 years working in a marketing communications roles in the agricultural world. And so I took Jay's advice and the second degree that I went after while I was working was a degree in learning design and technology in the uh, Department of Curriculum and Instruction. And uh, you might enjoy this uh, being an instructor. <laughs> the reason I picked that program was because it was the only one I could find at the university where I worked, so I would get the, the discounts on the course price. It was the only one that offered any online courses. <laughs> so isn't that crazy? That was, that was how I selected my advanced degree, was because I could find one that offered online courses. And mm. they, that department was one of a couple departments at our university that was really pioneering the use of online coursework and not only online but asynchronous and that part was really important to me because I traveled a lot in my job and I, I couldn't go attend physically attend a class Monday Wednesday and Friday or you know whatever the schedule so that was how my career kind of took a shift towards uh, course design and I became as an adult learner in those online classrooms I became very passionate about how to, first of all, reach out and be meaningful with your content to other adult learners or non-traditional learners, and, and then also how to connect with people in the online classroom. And I had several instructors that did that really well. And we're talking, when I started that degree, it was 2003, and I finished it, it took me five years <laughs> going a course at a time. Sometimes I would have to entirely skip semesters if there wasn't the course that I needed in my plan of study, if it wasn't being offered. So I graduated from, with my master's in uh, fall, fall semester of 2008. 
So I'm one of those rare folks that went back for another degree 17 years later after finishing my undergrad. <laughs> so I want to encourage anybody who's out there watching or participating in the lab or listening later on the podcast that you can do that if you want. And I'm a just a huge believer of any kind of lifelong learning, anything that you can do to, to uh, strengthen your own knowledge and fill those knowledge gaps. And it, in my eyes, it does not have to be a degree program. I, uh, you probably already know this, but I just love consuming courses in Udemy and platforms like that. Mm. Um, so you can explore lots of other topics. So that's, mm. uh, that's kind of where I am. I've, uh, from my university work and then I, have uh, been building a, a digital online business on the side. So you've probably heard that term. I think Chris Ducker calls it side hustle. So my my evening hours, my weekend hours, I spend a lot of that time building my own courses unrelated to the things that I do at the university and coaching other people who are interested in either designing courses to meet their customers' needs or uh, helping uh, other people who teach in uh, academic environments too. So that's really fun for me to do. That's fantastic. And saying it is really the, the online course in, uh, industry is just absolutely booming. And I forget the exact figures. It's in one of my courses, but it's like we're talking billions of dollars and in excess of 9% growth per, per annum. So it is a, it is a booming industry. And that's, and that's where we're finding all these people jumping on to uh, create all their their online courses, and mm -hmm. and and then you look at at, at Udemy, the marketplace, and there is a plethora of of of, of courses to choose from, and, and there's hundreds of courses being added every month, and those courses range from a, a, absolutely exceptional, um, you know, well produced. Uh, the you know, the content is just out of this world to some very ordinary, um, <laughs> it, like, like, obvious people have just seen it as as a money spinner. And I think, I think it's important that if you're going to go into the um, online teaching environment, that, that the, the money is actually secondary. Like the, like, like the money will come. If, if, if you go on and come into this industry, just because you say, look, it is, it is a booming and it's still very much in its infancy. Like we are sort of you know, riding you know, before the wave. So, People say, oh no, this no, this this is this is going to be big. There's so much money, you know, it's multi-billion dollar. And if you come in with that um, attitude, then you'll be you'll be seen, you'll be exposed, and you you, you won't succeed. I think as instructors, mm -hmm. the only way that, that you're going to succeed as an instructor is to demonstrate your passion. What do you reckon? Mm -hmm. Oh, I completely agree with that. That. I think it's any any kind of business that you want to pursue, particularly from an entrepreneurial standpoint. If you don't have a lot of passion about it and simply about helping other people in whatever your craft is, I don't think that you'll have the endurance to stick with it for a long time. And the I've been doing it for a long time and I, now I'm new, new to to teaching in Udemy, for instance. So I, I've made the big fat, you know, zero so far in Udemy. And I, um, but you know, even there, I started with a topic because there are a lot of different topics I thought about pursuing, but I picked the one that I had a huge amount of passion about. And, and I started there and I'm going to create two more courses so that I'll have a series of courses along that topic line. But the, the financial piece of it has not, been a driver for me. I, I of course will love it in the end if it ends up, uh, you know, covering some of my expenses and uh, would will be absolutely delightful if at some point it was a, a full time income for me. But that was not my uh, intent when I started out. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Like when when I first put my my, my first course up was actually a strapping and taping course because I said I've got a background in working with elite athletes. So, uh -huh. so my so my background was you know, strapping, injury management, everything else. So my first course was that. Now I I knew as a very very niche subject, and, and the only reason why I did it was because every time I held a workshop or taught taught this particular thing in class, because you know, you know people who were who were studying remedial massage or those sort of things, this is this is a subject that they that they had to cover, and and, and people always said, 
because it's so complex, some of the some, some of the techniques are so complex, say, do you have a DVD? And I'd say, no. I said, no, I'd have, I'd have 30 students cramming around me with iPhones re, you know, recording me as I was strapping down, this is ridiculous. So so I, I went out and I created this course and I and I said, no more recording, number one. Like just just let me you know move move my elbows while I'm working here. And at the end of the so then like at it's 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 a back of back of room offer at the end of my workshops now. So I say, okay, look, I've shown you, and as you walk out the door, you're probably going to forget 90%. But the good news is you can go on to Udemy and you can get this course for nine like no, it's listed for forty seven dollars. I'll give you a code and you can pick it up for, for nineteen dollars. And, uh -huh. and 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 so that's so that's the way that I that, that I married a face to face because I still do a lot of face to face coaching or, or, or workshop teaching everything else. So that's where I married an online course with a workshop. So they marry up very well there. But I mm -hmm. but I agree with you. I know I, I I'm definitely not making um, enough money to retire on. I think as you as you create more courses and you and you cross promote like I think I I um, multiplied my monthly income by six between August and and uh, sorry it was, what July and August or something so I've, mm -hmm. I've, had a, I've had a huge jump in income in in that period but that's I've also you know, in, introduced a new course last month so mm -hmm. I think as you introduce new courses no things are going to change now one of the things so so no, because we're talking about a, a new look on mm -hmm. uh, on student engagement and no one of the things when you are creating your courses is that it is really a one-way street it's it's you and the camera or it's you and the computer and you and and you're stream stream casting screen casting mm -hmm. and you've got absolutely no idea there's there is no pulse at least if you're teaching face to face and you now you see people's eyes rolling in their head then you know that you may have to rephrase and and and, and re-deliver that content differently um if you see them nodding off and going and starting to snore then you know that you've really got to up the you know, up the energy but mm -hmm. when you but when you're teaching via a computer it's it, it's very very much on my and it's the same as when i was doing my audio podcast and i was doing those monologues i had i had no pulse i had no idea whether i was delivering information that people wanted or liked so there is there, there's definitely a skill in um in in, in delivery so, so not only mm -hmm. what we'll, we'll talk about delivery then we'll, we'll talk about the asynchronous side as well mm -hmm. but um i'm also like i i started playing music from a very early age but the last time i played in the band was about 30 years ago so mm -hmm. i'm still i'm still an entertainer at heart but i probably entertain in, in different different ways and well you know when i got into massage i had to stop playing guitar because i got too many calluses on my fingers and people didn't like that <laughs> so um so anyway let's 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 firstly look at engaging content from from a from, from like more your perspective how are you going to engage your student through your videos and do you want to save the tie-in to the entertainment piece a little bit later is that what you're no, suggesting you, no you can you can no you just you, you we can talk about it now you talk about whatever <laughs> you like whenever you like all right <laughs> well there's a few tricks that i use and as i'm as i'm sharing these know that they intermingle between the courses that I would create for Udemy or platforms like that one or things that I do at the university as well. And in some cases that would be coaching professors who are uh, just uh, starting to teach distant students and they're asking me questions about how they would engage with their students. And that can be pretty daunting if you've never done it before. And a lot of times you'll find that that what, whether you're a, a university instructor or let's say you're a business owner that would like to create a course that um, would reach your customers with some information that would be helpful about a product or a service, but you're not used to teaching, that can be pretty scary. And so you add that with, and you're talking into a camera, that can just cause some people to say, yeah, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's uh, not for me. And as you know, there's so many uh, different ways that you can create. If we're, if we're just talking video courses for the moment, you know, they don't have to be 
your talking head on camera like we are right now, they uh, certainly could be screencast with Camtasia or ScreenFlow or any of those kind of software are wonderful. If you'd rather speak to a PowerPoint or keynote presentation that you created. So I, I help people kind of mix it up depending on you know where they are on the learning curve and their level of comfort. But one of the things that you and I were emailing about the other day as we were planning this conversation or to meet on Blab here is uh, I've spent a lot of time on the stage entertaining people as a musician. My husband has a band. His name is Scott Greason, and uh, we travel around the state of Indiana on the weekends. This is another side hustle. <laughs> so he's got a day job too. Um, entertaining audiences uh, with music that fits in the Americana, that's what we call it over here anyway, Americana genre. And um, a lot of things from just years of gaining comfort being in front of audiences that I use when I'm uh, on camera for a course or if I'm coaching somebody about that. And a couple little tips I'll just throw out there for your listeners would be uh, to smile a lot, no matter how uncomfortable you might be. I always make myself smile before I click the record button so that you're already looking upbeat and energized before things are rolling. I've I think we might talk a little bit later about Periscope, but I'll just throw in that I've seen a number of people on Periscope when they start their broadcast as they're waiting for people to come on. They're just, you know, looking at the camera <laughs> and, and kind of deadpan. And that's a moment when you still need to look happy and excited about being there. Uh, so we do that on, we try to make sure that we do that on stage too. And another thing that I tell myself when we go out on stage, because sometimes we'll play for very small audiences and sometimes they are huge crowds and we're under lights and we can't even see the people that we're entertaining because the lights are blinding us. So in either of those instances, we as a band will talk to each other. My husband and I talk in the car as we're going to the venue that we want to perform every song as if the people out there, whether it's one or a thousand, that they've never heard it before. We've done it a thousand times, but you have to play every chord, sing every note of harmony, whatever it is you're doing, you've got to do it for the person who's never heard it before. And that works really well if you think along those lines when you're recording a video for your course. If you have an energy about it as if, I am so excited to deliver this content for that one person who's never heard it before. They're going to be appreciative of what you've just taught them, and they're going to love that you had some energy about it. So that's that's something I try to keep in the back of my mind, that your own energy will transfer over to your students and, and then also makes them more forgiving. That even if you goof something up or you misquote something or like today I did a Periscope earlier with my mom, who's my course content expert in that World War II course, and my smartphone fell off the tripod. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we had all this crash and <laughs> it was really kind of embarrassing, but we just both laughed right through it and kept smiling. And I was saying as my phone was face down on the carpet saying, you know, stay with us, everybody. We had a phone crash. I'm coming back. <laughs> so, you know, even people who've used a lot of technology all their life, they still have, you know, bloopers. And so I, I think you probably decrease the number of eye rolls from your students if you just have fun with it and keep smiling and keep reaching out to that student who maybe has never heard it before. Absolutely. I, no, there, there were so many my gems in that that last little two minutes that you that you gave us there. I was I was talking with with um, Bob Marks yesterday on a on another blab, and I I did one of his courses, and I actually I recommend it to to anybody. That's that that five day uh, credit unity course in five days or less. And I said to him, you know, mate, I found myself smiling through your course because you weren't afraid to have a chuckle, mm -hmm. and and it, it was just really light and upbeat, and the information was was spectacular but it was delivered really really well and i also um i've 
I've, I've learned along the way too that it's when you when you're engaging your students, and I usually do this like in the, in a classroom environment, have a have have them sort of laughing as well. So now that doesn't mean you have to be a comedian. But, but studies have, have shown that if somebody is actually enjoying themselves and laughing, their retention rate is, is actually through the roof. Yes. And the other thing too is like saying, whether you're on, on camera or screencasting, still smile when you're talking because that changes your entire tone. It does. And lifts your energy. And the thing is that when we're on camera or when we're recording our voice, we lose a lot of it, like, like, like that medium actually dulls us down. So you've really got to raise your energy. And even if you think you're being hyperactive and over the top, when you look at the recorded um, outcome, it, it, it's not over top at all. It, it, it's it's energetic and it's and, and it's and it's you know, it, it's full of energy, but it's not you know, crazy. So so don't so if you feel that oh my goodness, now people, people think I've, I've taken some pep pills. By the time they see the recording, it, it looks it, it it just looks engaging. Mm -hmm. Oh, I so agree. As we're in in my uh, university job, we work a lot with our graduate students and helping them improve their presentation skills. And we see such a difference in in the students who smile when they're presenting, and they they present on some pretty heavy topics. They're I, I can't even really describe to you what all their research is in. Um, but boy, when when one of them gets brave enough to come out from behind a podium or a computer console where they're present where their computer is, and they got their pointer, if they step out to the front of the audience and smile a little bit and their energy comes up and you can i'm often in the back of the room uh, when when they're practicing these presentations and you can just see the the audience kind of lift and gain interest uh, when mm -hmm. they do that but i it, it is like 10x when you talk about doing it on video it's it's harder to do that way mm -hmm. For sure. Okay, let's 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 now talk about. So we've we've spoken about how to get our our content across in like so it's, it's energetic, it's enjoyable, it's engaging, and hopefully it's informative. And I think I think that's the other thing too that when we're putting our courses together that 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 more isn't necessarily best. Mm -hmm. if, if 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 you can you you just need to take as long as you need to do to to teach somebody something and don't and don't need to fill it out with fluff so if if you can tell somebody how to do something in half an hour take half an hour don't fill it out to a hour and a half course because you think that people will see an hour and a half and think it's worth more mm -hmm. i think i think that really this comes back to, to, to engagement too like you've got to stay on topic when you were presenting so so you're saying like in this in this lecture you are going to learn abc you teach them ABC, and you move on to the next lecture. You don't. You then. You don't go sidetracking off onto onto D in that lecture. That mm -hmm. you, I think. I think Udemy is uh, is, is sort of in, in sort of cracking down on that too, and saying, "Look, no, please stay on." And welcome, Jerry. Welcome to the call. Um, yeah, just stay. Yeah, stay focused and deliver your message. People's time is precious, and it's. Yeah, more is not better. Mm -hmm. I I so agree with that. We get into the habit from a college or university setting of feeling like we have to be, we call it the sage on the stage. Have you heard that phrase before? <laughs> uh, for a 50 minute, in our university, it's a 50 minute time block or an hour and 15 minute time block, depending on which day you're teaching. And and that does, first of all, that doesn't work well at all in a face-to-face, in-person classroom, but it certainly does not work on video. And uh, in, my, in my previous role, we had created a series of uh, courses that ended up being very successful from a revenue-generating standpoint on uh, Lean Six Sigma. And people were taking those courses to get their certifications in Lean and in, in Six Sigma as a, either a green belt or a black belt. And we learned lessons by, just by doing. You know, I, the, I, now I'm, I'm getting out on a sidebar or a tangent, but I do encourage you just to get started. Um, if you are, don't wait till you think that everything is perfect because you will you will learn and you'll find the things that you need to improve once you get rolling. And if I go back to that example with our Lean Six Sigma courses, 
uh, the first round of video shooting that we did, the videos were longer, somewhere between 10 to 30 minutes each. And we were carefully watching the feedback of the students. And we'd have about 1,400 students go through those courses each year. For that program was a, a large number. And we would do course evaluations, uh, formative evaluations, as well as at the end, we'd do summative evaluation. And, and then we'd also take our feedback from our instructors who were facilitating the courses. And in the end, when we started working on a brand new series in project management, we created videos that were in the length of three to five minutes max. And that was feedback that we got from our students. And we each video was one topic only in that instance. And another thing that allows you to do is if something gets out of date in one of those videos, it's so much easier. Whether you're a single person running a, a business on the side like I'm doing, so if I wanna pull a video out of my Udemy course and replace it with something else, it's not a big financial endeavor to do that because I've just covered one topic in each video. And the same thing with the university where they have a lot more money invested in the creation of the videos using you know, well-paid videographers and equipment and all of that. Uh, but if something gets outdated, it's so much simpler. And by design, we actually use several different people to deliver the content so that our learners wouldn't get real attached to just one person on video. So that if you change videos, let's say two years later and you can't get the same person, then it's not gonna mess up your course because the students are already seeing several different people delivering content. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know that that particular bit of advice would cross over all that well for a Udemy instructor, but might be something that you consider to uh, mm -hmm. pick things up a little bit. Yeah, I think like as a, as it, it's, a, it's a good point about uh, in that environment where you do have staff coming and going. Mm -hmm. But I think as, as in, independent instructors, we'd like to hope that if we are swapping videos in and out, it's still our own work. But that doesn't mean that we can't you know, say, if something changes, do something like a Blab mm -hmm. or a Periscope, save, save that's because I've actually have done a course on Periscope for online instructors and coaches. I, I love Periscope. And I think that's a, that's a very, very quick way. So that if, if something changes in your industry, if something changes in your topic um, subject that you can actually do a, a quick periscope to to bring that information to your, to your viewers, save it to your camera roll and then put that, so swap it into your course and saying, okay, this is the update. Mm -hmm. So, so, so fantastic stuff. And, and we'll talk about using social media um, shortly. Mm -hmm. I also find now we're talking you know, blabbing because I, I fell in love with periscope before I found blab. I think as, as most people did, because I think, Periscope came just a tiny bit before mm -hmm. before Blab by by a couple of months, um, and Blab Blab to me is just this this amazingly flexible tool. Because saying like at the moment we're now doing a a video podcast, and I'm saying and, and and we will be opening up that seat at the end. And, and if you have any questions at all, please feel free to type them into the the sidebar there. We're more than happy to answer questions along the way. Um, but this now we now we're talking about stepping out from that that that, that one-sided uh, conversation into engaging with your students. And I've probably in the last two days said, well, this this is my third blab in two days, okay. um, and it's been it's been great. And yes, and, and last night we had somebody jump on into the hot seat, and we actually did this this really in-depth, mind-boggling coaching session. Oh, that's so we neat. Had, so we actually had people asking questions down the side. We had somebody, what we call hot seat coaching. Uh -huh. So, so you know, as as coaches and instructors, this is a, this is an amazing tool to to interact. And because we're so saying, like I, I always say, as instructors, we assume that our communication is clear, mm -hmm. and it often isn't. Like we are putting courses out all around the world. In a lot of cases, whether we're whether our native language, so I'll say my native language is English. So English isn't everybody's native language. It's, you know, it's, it's somebody's second or third. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if I use, I try not to use Australian slang because I know that even fellow English speakers in other countries have no idea what I'm talking about. It's the same as like, like US slang or UK slang. Mm -hmm. right? So you, you, you've, you've got to keep, you've got to come back to, 
the purer side of the language when you when you know, when you're communicating your courses. But even even so, when you you you, know, you, you might have a have a point, and it's not that clear to a to somebody who doesn't speak your language natively. And so then they might ask you a question in the in the discussion box, or they, or they they might message you, and then you and then you type back, and then you you think that you're being very clear, and that's purely an assumption that one should one should never make. Mm -hmm. So coming coming back to these now to these platforms where you you say as instructors, it's not. So this 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 goes back to you know the money making model as well, where people think, okay, I'm I'm going to make a a really quick half hour. Um, course. I'm going to put up on Udemy. I'm going to charge $197. It's going to have abs absolutely no substance, but it's going to sell for 10 bucks, and I'm going to make a million dollars. Doesn't work that way. Well, well, well. <laughs> as, in, as, in, as instructors, as passionate teachers, and also as lifelong learners ourselves, we've got to make ourselves available to our students outside of the course. And I think these platforms are really now, um, you know, taking taking everything online learning to a whole new level because now we are you're, you're sitting in in my lounge room and I can answer any question and I can clarify anything as well so so if you ask a question I answer it's still not clear we can go through a whole process to make sure that you walk away knowing exactly what you're doing and now we are now really guiding and helping you along to your learning objectives yes I go ahead no you go, you go. <laughs> I was just breathing. I have really been enjoying using now for me it's been Periscope. I started on Meerkat and then Periscope came along a few weeks I'm not sure exactly, but like a few weeks later and I've decided I think I like Periscope better. I still use both of them and I think they still they both have a place. Um, this is the first blab that I've participated in. I've watched some but uh, had not been in the hot seat <laughs> so until today so i appreciate the opportunity to get this experience and i see it i just want to say ditto to what you just shared that it's a great tool for those purposes and i also see these type of platforms as a really neat way to answer the frequently asked questions in a course or um I've been using them for answering questions that come up in my Udemy course in the discussion forum. So I do address them in the discussion for, forum so they are typed out there. But then I'm also, uh, in, the, in my course, I was interviewing my mom on camera. So it's the two of us in the videos. And so I've been bringing her onto the periscopes and then people are asking us, uh, we're either uh, developing out further our response in the Periscope, or then they're also asking us other questions, you know, once the discussion gets going. So it's a really neat way to connect with learners when the course itself is asynchronous and it's not marketed as something where you have to be online at the same time as the instructor. But I, my hope is that maybe in the long run, I'll uh, gain additional students in the course, or maybe those students will be interested to see what the next course is that I offer because they know they have a way to connect with me in real time. So we'll mm -hmm. see. That's still mm -hmm. an experiment for me. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I so far it's been, we've had some fun chats on Periscope uh, with our students. Yeah. And I say, look, I mean to say, this is this is revolutionary. You know, these two platforms. I think in the last in the last week, uh, I've seen a couple of instructor blab Facebook groups start up, and and then all these instructors drop, you know, jumping on the blab because initially they thought it was just another squirrel that was just just another thing to take your your attention away from everything. But I think that the, the true power of, of this platform is is really starting to to shine through. And coming back to your use of of Periscope saying I sort of saw a saw a little niche there so I created a course on that and and Periscope and and Blab are two totally different things but two very useful tools to the instructor because with Blab okay this 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 is still new but I think you can I think for Apple users you can have a there's a Blab app mm -hmm. um, but I think Blab is still really like a, a a PC or a Mac based sort of situation, whereas Periscope is in your pocket. And just to just to give you an example, 
I I've left elite sport. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. I've left elite. I, I don't I don't work in teams anymore. I, I still work with elite athletes, but I, I don't work in a team environment anymore. But I do help out at a, at a local AFL, like a, an Australian Rules Football Club, just just up the road. That's where my son plays. Mm-hmm. And so one day, I actually took my my camera in and I said, "Okay, we're actually going to to, to stream this live." And so my son held the camera as I actually strapped and prepared the players for training. Mm-hmm. And so then we had people coming in from Eastern Bull and all over the place, and they were asking questions and everything else. And it was it was really good. But it was really funny to, and I've actually included that that uh, broadcast in my Periscope course, but but you'll hear us saying that every two minutes, we're broad, no, we're, no, we're live streaming around the world, guys. We're doing, no, we're live streaming. And the reason why we, we, we repeat ourselves is because we're in a football club and we've got to be, be very careful about language and behaviour because uh-huh. um, <laughs> footballers can be a little bit foul-mouthed and they can do inappropriate things because they think it's, it's funny. So we had to say... So that's so, so. So people say, why? No, why do you keep on saying this every two minutes? And the reason why we're saying it every two minutes is to avoid, you know, the f bomb and, and that sort of stuff, and and and, and having inappropriate stuff just come and just blow the you know, the book because because we wanted to use that, and 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 that, and as it was, one person because it was just part of his everyday speech, dropped the f bomb, and I had to sort of edit that out when I put it on to onto you to me but i was saying and then then another time i was sitting and, and a, a personal trainer friend of mine uh, came came for a visit because i just moved into a new a new place mm-hmm. and she was she was you know, talking about how, how wonderful periscope is and i said yeah i know and she said and you can do this and i said i know and i said how about i just interview so so we just picked up the camera and so i just picked up the phone and i interviewed her because you know she says oh look i, I use periscope to show people cooking like how to do nutrition and i, and I show periscope use periscope to do this and i said okay well, I'm, I'm just going to interview you and ask you how you use periscope as a as a coach so that's that's the beauty of periscope is because it's, it's an anywhere anytime as long as you've got an internet connection you can do that whereas you know, blab is a different type of tool this is where we can because you know Periscope is basically you, like you, you, it's either you, your talking head, or you're you know, interviewing something else or showing somebody something, and then mm-hmm. you're then talking. Like, like if people have a question, you can answer. But this is just so much, so much better. Mm-hmm. It's like, as a as a coaching tool, this is so much better. As a as a as a as an instructional tool, Periscope, depending on what you, you know what you're doing, like you just look at all different things. You can be at a at a conference. And you're walking you know, around the foyer, and you see one of the keynote speakers, and you go, "Excuse me, do you mind if I just interview for five minutes for my you know, for my viewers?" And, and, and you pull out your phone, and you start to interview this keynote speaker. And the next minute, somebody starts asking you, "Oh, can you ask this? Can you ask this?" And then they are actually directing the interview. Mm-hmm. I mean, what technology is this? So fantastic! And then they're saying we can save that to our camera roll and put it into our course. Amazing stuff. But you are the social. You, you're the one who teaches courses on social media. So why don't you talk about the wonders of how you're using you know, Periscope and and these other social well, media channels? Uh, it, my favorite. I've already mentioned it. It's the new the new one in Periscope. Um, in terms of at least how I've been using it to connect with learners uh, that are at a distance. We also have uh, used Twitter, and I. I still in that I think that's one of my favorite social media platforms and I know every everybody has a different one that's a favorite but I have really developed some interesting connections with people that have uh, you know led to business through Twitter and I that's just really cool to me and it also has the media are in Twitter so the the old public relations former marketing communications person in me loves the fact that you can tap into the media uh, rather quickly uh, on various subjects when you're in Twitter and I can share an example of that in a minute but uh, tweet chats I think are another really neat way and it's that's something that's pretty accessible for most of your learners you know most people have today as at least um of the students i've had in my courses they all have smartphones handy and nearly nearly all of them have a twitter account so uh, running a tweet chat is a an easy way to go because 
now I haven't heard the latest statistic, but the one I'm going to quote was from probably about a month ago, but only like 3% of Twitter users were on Periscope. Now, that's probably climbed quite a bit mm. since since I heard that. Um, but there's still a lot of people that when you say something about Periscope, they say, what? They, they have no idea. But if you say Twitter, they're more likely to have a Twitter account. If, if I refer back to the mm. university setting that I'm in in my day job, we do have to be pretty cautious about uh, things like this. We always have to make them optional because you can't uh, at a state funded institution, you can't be requiring that students have uh, certain tools like a smartphone or whatever. Um, that just doesn't fly. So, you know, we already have a learning platform that is it goes across all of the university. We happen to use Blackboard Learn, but there's lots of others that, you know, other universities use. Um, our university has been also looking at another one that they may eventually move to within the next couple of years. Uh, but that's something that that uh, our IT people who specialize in the teaching technologies are reminding me when I get all fired up about using a social media platform and they'll say, is it ADA compliant? Is it accessible? <laughs> so I, I do, I take that very seriously and I do want to pay attention to that. So if we do anything like a tweet chat, we always make that optional. So it's not part of a grade. It's not, uh, required thing that they have to do. And uh, so we have that information captured some other in some other place in the course so that students who weren't able to participate can still gain whatever knowledge it was we were sharing. Um, now in the non-credit courses that I was referring to, like that Lean Six Sigma program, we had a lot more flexibility in those kind of courses because they were not targeted for the students who were registered at the university for getting a degree. And so that's where I did a lot more experimentation with using things like tweet chats. And uh, that I found those, and you could take out the, the phrase tweet chat and insert Blab or Periscope or Meerkat. That is such a neat way to bring in outside content experts for just short moments in your course. So, you know, maybe somebody that you really would have liked to have hired or subcontracted with to teach some of your course, you know, be on video for some of your courses, but you couldn't get them. Well, you might be able to get them for 20 minutes of a tweet chat or 10 minutes of a Periscope. And like you were mentioning with that opportunity to capture a short interview with a keynote speaker when he or she is done uh, being a keynote at, at a conference in that same way, sometimes you can bring in experts that your students would think, I never in my wildest dreams thought I would get to learn from person Y or person X, you know, uh, but because you could snag them for just 10 minutes in a social media platform, you can present their knowledge and their expertise to your students. So I really love uh, social media for that uh, particular reason. Uh, something else I've done with, uh, it happened it was Meerkat because I wasn't on Periscope yet, but last spring when our instructors, now this was in a in kind of an interesting hybrid of a class where there were students in a classroom in a physical building and then also students that were signed up for the course in an asynchronous way. So the lecture was being captured and then those distant students would watch on their own time you know, throughout the week. And, but these homework assignments were pretty rigorous and the distance students were getting frustrated because they weren't getting access to the video lecture where the homework assignment was described. They, were, they weren't getting access to it mm. as quickly as the students in the class, but yet the instructor was keeping their deadlines the same. And so I, I found a use for Meerkat that worked really well. We'd have, we happened that we'd have several different guest presenters in this particular course. And so I would always check with each presenter and say, when you get to the point where you're going to be talking about the homework assignment, would you be comfortable if I live stream 
what you're going to say. And that means that anybody anywhere in the world can jump in on this. So it will not be private. Are you okay with that? And every one of them said, fine, I don't, I don't mind about that. And so I would meerkat the, whatever it was, five to 15 minute discussion about the assignment, capture the video on my phone, and then immediately after class, link that in Blackboard Learn so that the distance students could get it nearly as quickly as the students who were in class. And that solved the problem because then they got their instructions almost in real time. So at least they had them that that evening or, you know, they're in many different time zones, but uh, that that helped us solve that problem. Mm. And the instructor then really didn't have to shift gears at all. I, I just added that extra little piece. So there's another. Bit. Yeah. No. It's fantastic. I actually did a I actually did a MOOC a little while ago. It was by the University of New South Wales on how to teach online, and it was obviously geared you no know, K twelve and and university and everything else. So it probably a lot of it really wasn't um, geared towards mm -hmm. an, a, 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 like a Udemy structure level. It, but it was very very interesting to just see the intricacies and and all those considerations that you were talking about as far as accessibility and then actually everything, how everything has to slot into their particular system and <laughs> it must be an absolute nightmare. Let's, uh, let's, let's just really quickly um, recap some, some of the main, some of the main points when it comes to engaging with your, with, with your students. And, and so if you should want to, want to recap while you're you know, like, so, so some, some points to remember while you're recording your course and then, how to engage afterwards, and then we'll ask you how people can find out more about you. I have actually put a, a link to your course. Yeah, I just saw the, that. Thank the you. Sidebar there, and then also what will happen is that uh, when this becomes a podcast, so so this is a podcast, obviously, but uh, this this ep this episode won't be published onto my podcast oh. podcast until next Sunday. But there will be show notes along with this, and then th there will also be links. So. The, the beauty about podcasts is that they're you know, they're here forever, and even uh, you know, come back you know, three or four months later, three or four years later, you'll still be you know, people will still be clicking your link. So it's uh, it's, it's it's a pretty groovy, and I think you know, and, and and blabs and everything else like people can come back to the to to the blab re, you know, replays here. So so let's let's just I'll let you just recap very quickly about points to remember while you're presenting and then points to remember mm -hmm. while you're a couple of the points that i shared one was to smile when you're uh recording whether it's an audio recording or a video recording and also when you're presenting live so instructors who are listening or watching that's a big one no matter how what format you're teaching in smile while you're speaking and lift your energy like physically Think of you know bringing your shoulders up and see I wasn't doing that very well. <laughs> uh, physically changing your posture when you're teaching and it just conveys such a different sense of enthusiasm and energy to your students and they really appreciate it and I think stay better engaged when you're teaching. And the other piece about that smile just specifically related to when you're recording and that is to turn your smile on before you push record. It really, really helps. And then keep smiling right on out till the end. Um, the uh, see, what else did we talk about? The we talked a little bit about some of the tools that I use from the music performing industry, and and just to be thinking that there's always somebody out there in your audience, whether they are students physically in the room or whether they are distant students. Uh, watch what I meant just mentioned a few moments ago watching a captured lecture or if they're your students in Udemy watching your videos that um, they've never heard your content they've not ever heard your take on it before so uh, for for instance I've watched several courses in Udemy on how to design a course for Udemy and you know you might wonder well how many how many spaces are there available for courses on how to design courses? But people who are really uh, hungry for doing something well, they might sign up for more than one, like I have done. And I've, I've watched several of them from the front end to the back end, so all the way through. And 
every time you learn something new, you, you, there's a different nuggets that instructors offer that the other instructor didn't include in his or her course. So teach for that student who's really hungry to learn what you have to teach. And uh, we, we mentioned just being passionate about it. I think, I think that helps too. And in the end, when you're doing those, those types of things, plus lots of other things that create good quality videos, I think the revenue comes in the end when, when you've paid attention to those kind of details and you've had fun doing it. So uh, those are a few of the things that I recall from our earlier conversation. That's fantastic. I think just very quickly, I, I, want, to, I want to talk about an avatar because <clears throat> no, this is a, a thing that we talk about in internet marketing. But I think as a teacher, if you create an avatar of your student and then when you are cre when you're creating your course, yeah. you are talking to that one person. So, and I'm not talking about I'm not talking about a general uh, 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 a demographic of you no know, 25 to 35 living in this area. I'm talking about actually going right down to the nitty gritties. He's a married man. He's uh, he he drives half an hour to work. He, he works on the weekends. He doesn't have time for his his family. His wife's always nagging him about you know, working too hard. He, he, he wants to change his life so he wants to do and actually just write a story like write a write a bio about your student and then present to that student um make it make it you know, personable and i think that's i think that's i i know that in, in what i do i don't i don't, don't usually say hello everybody i'll say hello and welcome and i'll i'll, I'll be talking in the singular so that the people believe that i'm actually talking just to them. And I think that's, that's another great tip. engagement. Factor. I've been uh, doing it, developing my avatar for my new podcast of, about uh, making connections and online courses. And so I'm just in that phase right now where I'm picturing and writing out notes about who exactly who that person is. Um, another thing that I've done is I've actually physically taken the, uh, the uh, little, oh gosh, the, name just got out of my head, but the little tiny photos that we all have in the corner for our Twitter feed or Periscope. And I will make a little collection of them, of actual students that are in my course, put them on a little piece of paper and tape them on the tripod right under the camera. So you're actually speaking to students who are really in one of your courses. <laughs> and I saw a university professor mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. that about it's been like 12 or so years ago who was he was teaching at a distance. And at the time he was using uh, the equivalent to voiceover PowerPoint. And so he would put a composite of his distance of the photos of his distance students up on his office wall. And when he would record his next lecture, he would call out actual students names. You know, he'd look up on the wall, call out their names and and they all commented about that when when we'd meet them at the uh, they, that particular mm -hmm. program had a residency requirement so we'd get to meet them in person too they loved that about how how that professor did that yeah, so that absolutely. was where i got that idea and i, I just mm -hmm. yeah the power of the shout out that's fantastic okay um how can people find out more about you. Do you have any websites? You know, you do have a podcast coming up. So yes, once again, any, my any links website there? is my name, Vicki Maris.com. And Vicki is spelled V I C K I E Maris, M A R I S.com. And all the links that you might be looking for, like I have my Udemy courses linked from, from that page. But for those of you listening, we've set up a, a special price for for Tim's podcast listeners and for this blab. So uh, I would follow his link. <laughs> it should get a little better price for the course. Um, but I've also, if you'd like to join my mailing list, I ha uh, have a opt in form out there, and I'll be uh, reaching out to the people on my list to let them know when the podcast launches. And I'm really excited about it. I I've been a podcaster, and I'm actually going to take down my older show and uh, replace it and it was on a completely different topic but i i call it my you know that's where i got my feet wet in podcasting <laughs> oh. oh look there's many many popular po i look at um scott Patton. i don't know how many 
different uh, topics and, and different shows that he's got. I think you know, just because, like, I think once a podcaster, always a podcaster, always have something to say about something. I think you've got to have an opinion. If you if you've got an opinion, <laughs> I, you're a that's podcaster. That's probably safe to say that all of us podcasting <laughs> no. are very opinionated. <laughs> I just love that platform. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. And, and once again, my phone's my Google keeps on activating when I'm talking on on Blab. I have no idea. But just 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 let you know that this, if, even though this episode won't go live on my iTunes podcast, it will remain live on Blab. I'm not going to okay. hide it until it goes live on the other. So you can you can still send people to the to to this blab link so i believe this blab blab link will then automatically excellent. shoot them over to the replay anyway and then they'll, they'll still have access to to all those all those links and so everything you'll else in the me meantime. tweeting about it quite a bit <laughs> I'm, I'm such an avid social media fan and i'm a believer of tweeting things like this often i i so in case you happen to because <laughs> i'll be i'll be at mentioning you in those tweets so you're gonna see that <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and same here. And, and I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm not a great Twitter user. I've, it's something that I've never really fully understand, un, un, understood or grasped, basically because of the um, the 140k character. But I, I have recently discovered uh, Twitter cards or something or other, and 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 a, and a tool called Tweet Leads. So my, so my, my pinned uh, tweet on my profile actually goes hooks into. A lead capture, which then gives them a lead magnet about my Periscope for Great. online instructors and coaches. So I am I am starting to, to play a bit with you now with Twitter, and, and obviously now because of Periscope and, and Blab, I've got to. I actually do have a lot. I've, I've got just under six thousand Twitter followers. I just don't know how to engage them, and I've got over fifteen thousand LinkedIn and contacts. I don't even know how to engage them either. So I've 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 just gone along, sort of gathered all these. I know this tribe behind me. Well, but I, don't quite I need know to send to, you a, a well, complimentary copy of I my ebook. Know. Then I'm going to do that. <laughs> Lovely, yeah. Thank you. Saying, yeah, I, I suppose what I'm saying, I, I, I get worried about falling into the social media hole and never coming out. I think social media is a fantastic uh, tool, but sometimes you can just get a little bit distracted and sidetracked, and then all of a sudden, that I'm just going to take five minutes to check <laughs> this. Two hours later, yeah. You know, so I suppose that's why I really haven't taken the time because I really want to embrace something like LinkedIn where I've got all this, all these connections and obviously embrace Twitter. So that's going to happen soon. Vicky, it's been absolutely wonderful speaking to you. It's, it's, uh, it's been a long time coming and I thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, the conversation. Thank you so much for your time. And, and you did share lots of gems. Like, like people, if you, if you take these, you know, these, these points and you put them to work, you will find that your course content will be transformed and your your students will be so much more engaged and then coming onto these platforms like Periscope and Blab with the interaction side of things, you're gonna have a tribe of very, very- Well, thank you so students. much, Tim, for having me on the Blab and on your podcast. I really appreciate it. It's been a lot of fun to share with you and uh, with all of your followers. That's been Take great. Take care.